This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So we're going to talk about uh, what happens after uh, carotid intervention and um, talk a little bit about minor stroke and some, uh, I'll include some uh, events in the minor stroke category that you might not have considered to be appropriate for the, uh, to, to be included, but I'll, I'll show some outcomes that suggest they should be. So uh, I'm not an opponent of carotid stenting. I just think that we're doing carotid endarterectomy to protect the brain, uh, and until we can show that we really can equally protect the brain with stenting as we can with endarterectomy, uh, I think we're on the horns of a dilemma, as has been shown here just uh, in the previous speaker. So everybody's uh, familiar with the caress data. Uh, the combined endpoint was equivalent, but there are increased strokes with stenting uh, in increased uh, MI with uh, endarterectomy. So the uh, vascular community, the neurology community said stenting has more strokes and uh, that has uh, effectively limited uh, the number of stenting, uh, stents that have been applied uh, both in this country and around the world. Uh, possibly in response to that, for whatever reason, there was secondary analysis of the CREST trial uh, showing that, as predicted, there was decreased survival after periprocedural MI, saying, well, wait a minute, those periprocedural MIs actually are important and we should pay attention to them. And indeed, it's, uh, it's modestly impressive. Uh, and you, you, we would, uh, as I say, as we would predict, there's a three-fold, three-and-a-half-fold increased mortality after MI and after a biomarker rise. Is that a, like a minor MI? Um, so looking at this data, the data itself is a little less impressive just because the numbers are so small. But the bottom line is that out at four years, if you di did not have an MI, your risk of death was 6%. If you did have either a biomarker positive event or an actual EKG positive event, uh, your survival, your risk of survival uh, was lower, or your risk of death was lower, excuse me. So moving on to talk about strokes and minor strokes, we need to pause for a moment and get some definitions here. So I want you to answer if you can tell if a patient has had a paraprocedural stroke. Yes. When there's a change, the patient knows, the family knows, and I know. B, no. C, maybe, but it's often quite subtle. Well, you could knock me over with a feather. I'm up here. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's move on and talk about minor and major strokes. Um, and the question is, there, there, are there really consen NIH consensus guidelines on what constitutes a major and minor stroke? Yes, they're commonly used to grade deficits after stroke. There's even an article about defining that. B, or not. B, no, the neurologist can't agree on anything. And C, not sure. Well, um, Actually, Fisher defined in this article 18 definitions of the difference between major and minor stroke, and then with all due humility, proposed a 19th. This would explain why, when you're talking about paraprocedural stroke in the CREST trial, you had 300 potential events, which were adjudicated by six stroke neurologists 46 were deemed to be TIA or amaurosis fugax, and 81 were adjudicated as stroke, but 69 were periprocedural, 
and they decided that 56 of these were minor and 13 were major. Now, the question is, is this a minor stroke? Well, symptomatically, unbelievably, it is. But would you call it a minor stroke if it was yours or your family's? So, <clears throat> and to cut to the chase here, the article concentrates on the four-year outcomes, which uh, if your risk of uh, death is twice as high, almost, if you had a stroke as if you didn't. But what's really impressive is the one-year data because your, your risk of events after the stroke, you know that this is the paraprocedural time that the events happen. It's really within the first year that these patients have the higher risk, actually a six-fold risk of death at one year. I kind of think the patients would like to know that. This is also addressed in the uh, vascular surgery uh, group of New England's registry. They had 8,000 cases that were uh, stenting or endarterectomy. And at one year, the risk of death was 16% if you had an MI, 23% if you had a stroke. A significant difference. And these differences go away uh, at five years. But this is a pretty remarkable mortality rate uh, in this group. Uh, and compared to uh, if you had neither stroke nor death, your risk of death at one year was, was 4% and 20% at five years. I was looking at Linda's slides and saying, I, I bet there are some pretty high risk people here that are getting uh, interventions. Just recently in JVS from Italy, uh, there's an interesting uh, article and begins to get a data point which I think we really need to include. In the old VA trial, the asymptomatic trial, which nobody talks about anymore, which was done in the 80s, uh, TIA was included as a endpoint because Bob Hobson thought that it was important. I wasn't so sure at the time, but in retrospect, I think Dr. Hobson was right on. So the survival if you had a stroke at five years, this is survival data, not death data. Survival was 68%, 78% if you had a TIA, so it wasn't as bad as a stroke, but it was much worse than if you had neither a TI, TIA or a stroke. Now what's interesting about this is that as you would expect, the red line is the stroke, yellow line is TIA, blue line is uh, no event. The, Mortality risk after a stroke is indeed front-loaded, but there's also a fall-off later, and most of the TI-related events uh, actually are related, are, are late. Uh, so you wonder what this is actually due to, whether it's just a marker of ex more extensive disease, uh, but clearly it correlates with a reduced survival. Just to add to this, uh, their data here. Um, this is a natural history study. It is not a, a, a related to paraprocedural events. This is a Dutch study reported in The Lancet several years ago, but I think it's still illustrative that uh, TIA is a important marker of future risk. So these patients presented with a TIA at day zero, either to their hospital or their neurologist, were entered into the registry. And as you would expect, the red line is the stroke risk. Stroke risk is front-loaded. So most of this risk, as you would expect, is in the first year, excuse me, year or two. The blue line is the mortality, which continues to rise. The general population mortality is down here just over 1%. So TIA clearly marks a patient group with a reduced uh, future survival. For stroke, symptomatic stroke, I think the reason that there's a reduced survival, we can all surmise uh, because we've unfortunately uh, had some experience with that we like to keep that to an absolute minimum, of course. 
This is the SF36 data from the Crest trial. Notice the uh, scale here. This is major stroke, minor stroke, MI, uh, that's cranial nerve palsy, sorry. And um, what you see is after major stroke, these are all negative uh, impactors on quality of life. Minor stroke, many of these are not quite so severe, and you'll see the scale actually shifts here. Um, but two of them are your role, your physical role, assessment of your physical role, and your assessment of your emotional well-being. We know that depression and uh, your sense of well-being in terms of what you can accomplish is intimately tied to survival. That's now you know, a, a factor, and one of our colleagues is actually looking at that in terms of uh, people with cardiovascular disease. Those who are registered as being depressed do much less well uh, in their long-term follow-up than those patients who are not. So I presume that's part of it. This is MI, certainly people are not happy they had an MI, but it's much less of an effect even with this uh, scale, uh, which is much broader uh, than the scales for a major and minor stroke. Cranial nerve palsy actually hardly affects people at all, which I thought was very reassuring. So um, the late outcomes after carotid endointervention, uh, paraprocedural MI is bad, stroke is worse. Minor stroke and even TIA substantially reduce long-term survival. Well, what about silent infarcts? I'll lay a dollars to donuts that they also negatively impact late survival, just like TIAs. But that's my hypothesis. We have no data. Uh, I think it is very important that we are in a new era where we recognize that paraprocedural outcomes are only part of the cost of intervention. And seeing so I do have a little time here, I will show you one more slide, which is British data on the survival of the general population uh, in Oxford versus the population that has a TIA and the population that has a stroke. We need to pay attention to this. And I think uh, the Silk Road device, which was mentioned, may be a very good adjunct to carotid stenting. But until carotid stenting can show that it protects the brain as well as endarterectomy, I think we still need to be cautious, and certainly cautious, as was pointed out, with those patients that are very high risk for carotid stenting. Thank you very much.